comment on why it's not acceptable from a patient perspective to wait until all of this science is conclusive, however many years that might take. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Terry Robnett, and I am the founder and executive director of Cannabis Patients Alliance. And as Bob mentioned, I have uh, two state level appointments. One is on the Marijuana Education um, Oversight Committee. If you've seen those good to know campaigns on the radio or on TV, that's us. And then I was also appointed to the Scientific Advisory Council. And that group took $10 million from um, overcharging um, patient license fees and moved that into um, to, uh, to fund research into the benefits and efficacy of medical marijuana. And that was really important because there isn't any public money available to look at benefits and efficacy of medical marijuana. All of our um, federal funding through NIDA, it all looks at um, potential for abuse and um, negative health impacts. That's the studies that they fund. So this was really, really important, even though it was this, I mean, nine, nine, ten million dollars sounds like a lot of money, but when it comes to research, it's not. But to have this little pot of money to actually put toward um, quality research. So in the, the bill that, that established this, um, it's all doctors. All doctors, researchers, clinicians, MDs, PhDs, but we managed to get one little seat in there for a patient representative. Since the money came from patients, we figured patients should at least have a say so in how it's spent. And I was, I'm honored to say that I was chosen to represent patients on that council. So I am the only one, the only one on there that does not have an MD and PhD behind her name. So I am talking and trying to educate these doctors that are, I mean, we have like the, the head of emergency services for Children's Hospital. We have, you know, Laura Borgelt, this pharmacologist out at Anschutz. I mean, we have all these really amazing people. And so um, for me, when, when I first walked into this, I mean, I think they were probably pretty skeptical. You know, who is this patient that thinks that she knows everything and can keep up with all of us? So I was really put on the spot to, to, to be able to hold my own with them. And it, it was incredibly stressful. When it came down to look, reviewing these, um, these um, applications for grant money, I mean, I stressed, my husband can tell you, I stressed for weeks because I had a very different position, a different job with this, which was that all of the, the um, applications were reviewed by three reviewers and they were scored. And then they selected the top, I think we had the top 18 um, applications out of the 70 something that we received, took those, and all of those came to me. And I reviewed every single one of them from the perspective of a patient, whether or not this was actually, is this something that patients would participate in? Is this actually going to have some, provide some beneficial information for patients? Is this good use of patient resources and patient money? So I reviewed every one of those final um, research uh, grant proposals. And then we all got together and we talked about them and um, went through all of them, did our own scoring, and came up with nine in the final outcome, the final ones. So we, we, we um, gave money to do research on some really awesome stuff. PTSD, IBD, which Colton is, is part of. Um, uh, epilepsy, we've got a couple of set studies on, on pediatric epilepsy that we funded. We funded one on pediatric brain cancer, on oxyco um, on the, the on, um, pain with comparing oxycodone with um, the results from cannabis, um, Parkinson's. I mean, we, so this is awesome money because we've never been able to do this before, and I am so proud and honored to have been part of this process. It was a great education for me because I learned how to talk to doctors, to talk to them about what the real experience was. And we developed this great relationship where they filled in the, the gaps in my knowledge when it came to research and protocols and, and how these studies. Let me tell you, 
looking at a study from the front end before it's ever done is completely different than looking at it from the back end after it's done and you're looking at results. Very different process, especially for me. So when it came down to um, needing to know what the real life boots on the ground effect would be on patients for any of these studies, for any of this work, that was my job. And I'm really happy that we made, we really worked out a relationship where we all relied on each other and that I was treated not as the outsider, but as an equal, a peer, and someone that came to this and brought valuable information. In other words, the voice of patients was heard in this process, and that was so critically important. Now, to give you quickly a little background for me, is I have fibromyalgia. I was diagnosed with fibrositis 28 years ago, and since then was re-diagnosed um, about 10 years later by a rheumatologist with fibromyalgia. I was lucky the first five years after the car accident that triggered my fibro, I worked with a team of alternative practitioners. So I didn't get as deeply into the trap of um, opiate painkillers that a lot of other friends of mine and fibro patients have gotten into because I did a lot of work with massage, with acupuncture, with chiropractic, with diet, with supplements. Etc. So I had a really broad kind of regimen or routine um, for my therapy. But um, in 2000, in 2006, my stepfather was diagnosed with lung cancer, and I um, worked with my mother and did hospice care for him for the final year and a half of his life. And I will tell you, it wasn't the lung cancer that killed him; it was the the side effects of the pharmaceuticals that he was given. He was given some um, experimental um, chemotherapy drugs, and eventually he got where he couldn't eat. He had sores all over his body, in his mouth, down his throat, etc. And I didn't know then what I know now. I didn't know about chemo this then. And I went to every one of his doctor's appointments, every one of his therapists, every one of his you know, specialists, the home health nurse, everybody. And not once in that entire year and a half did anyone, this is when I'll start crying with me, not ever once in the entire time did anyone suggest that cannabis might help his treatment, that it might help with the side effects, that it might even keep him alive. Not once. This was after Amendment 20. This was when we already had legal medical marijuana. A year and a half of doctors my father, my stepdad's dead. I never, ever want someone else to go through what I went through. If someone is free to choose that marijuana is not right for them, that's fine with me. But I want people to make that choice out of a place of knowledge and information and not because nobody said anything. So for me, people ask me where my passion comes from. It starts in that place, because I want patients to at least have the, enough knowledge that they can make that decision. We have almost 108,000 registered medical marijuana patients here in Colorado. Last month, less than 300 doctors in the entire state wrote a recommendation for medical marijuana. Less than 300. We have over 20,000 20, li licensed medical professionals in this state, and less than 300 of them wrote a recommendation for medical marijuana last month. We have a, a close group of about a dozen or so doctors across the state that write recommendations for medical marijuana as part of their regular practice. That's it. Those are our specialists. And I challenge all of you, like you had said, like you said, to get information, to get educated, because patients need you. They need the knowledge and the information. Bob and I were talking yesterday about there's a lot of people, when I talk to, to medical professionals, a lot of times they want to move marijuana into the pharmaceutical realm. Well, we just need to do the research. Just move it into Schedule 2, let us do the research. 
Find out what the doses are. Chop, it, chop marijuana up. Pick out the different cannabinoids. See if, if we could just do CBD by itself. If we could just get CBD alone to work, that would be awesome because you can't get high off of that. So it's okay for kids. So we can do that. But let me tell you, I believe that pharma will struggle, will struggle with cannabis for a long, long time because of what Sanjay Gupta has called the entourage effect. This is a very, very complex plant. It has cannabinoids. I think recently I read they discovered the 138th cannabinoid in marijuana. 138 cannabinoids. And then there are terpenes and flavonoids and all these other chemicals that, that go in to make this an amazing plant. And the idea that you can slice it and dice it and make it work the same, I think, is flawed. So, in the meantime, while we're doing the research and pharma is continuing to try and figure out how to make this work in their system, patients still need the benefits of cannabis. Because I can tell you, I talk to patients every day who are telling me about how cannabis is saving their lives, is helping them. I talk to parents with kids with epilepsy and brain cancer. I talk to, to adults who are in fourth stage cancer that are taking thousands of milligrams of THC a day and beating back late stage cancer that when they developed tumors while well, they were taking chemotherapy, now they're off and the cannabis is, is causing those tumors to recede. I talked to patients who are using cannabis for migraines, for chronic pain, for epilepsy, from MS. My stepbrother died of ALS a month after my stepfather died. Neither of them used cannabis. And I look back at that and I think, damn, if I only knew then what I knew. So please, get educated. Let's do the research, but in the meantime, give patients the opportunity to have beneficial access to this medicine, because let me tell you, they really need it, and it's really doing amazing work. Colton is here as an example. I'm here as an example. I could not do this. I could not be out here on the, the treatments that I was prescribed, but I can be, because all I use is cannabis now to treat my pain, to treat my anxiety, to treat my, my chronic fatigue, to treat the digestion, to treat the insomnia. I use cannabis. That's all. And I never have to worry about drug interactions like I did with all the pharmaceuticals that I was prescribed. It's amazing. So please, I am an advocate. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not unbiased about this. Because I believe that it works. I have seen too many children in the middle of an epileptic seizure where you take this concentrated oil and rub it on their gums and the seizures stop. You see that once or twice and you say, yes, this is a miracle. This, there's something here. There's something here. And we need to investigate that. We need to make sure that the benefits are recognized and available. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. A couple of notes for